Hi, guys. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he likes long walks in the park and naked volcano fights. It's Alexander Skarsgård. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming out this, uh, this Thursday evening for just, you know, a nice little rom-com for the family, a <laughs> sweet one. Um, guys, let, let's give it up for this movie. I've seen this movie twice. I'm obsessed with it. Do you enjoy The Northman, first of all? Okay. Thank you. Um, Thanks for coming by, man. This is, so this is home. This is one of uh, Alex's homes. So welcome back home to New York City. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Um, congratulations on this one, man. This is, I, you know, I, I'm a sucker for a big, big swing of a movie, and you guys went all out for this one. I pity the fools that try to do the next Viking film <laughs> <laughs> after this. Um, talk to me a little bit about this. I know this is a passion project for you. I don't know what that says about you, that your passion project is... To fight naked on top of a, an erupting volcano. Exactly. Yeah. This is what every boy dreams of, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but how far back does this go? Like, as a kid, were you raised on tales like the Northmen? A um, little bit. We, m my great grandfather uh, built a house on an island called Erland in the uh, in the Baltic, and uh, we've had it's been in the family ever since, and we go there every summer, and. and uh, um, it happened to be uh, a, a, a place with uh, over almost 200 uh, rune stones from the Viking Age. So I, some of my earliest memories are from walking around the island with my grandfather and seeing these massive rune stones and him telling me about the, the runic inscriptions and what they, um, the tales that were told on these rune stones about these on intrepid explorers to faraway lands, and that was obviously quite um, exciting for a young boy. So uh, I think somewhere, I, I didn't even want to be an actor at the time, like it took 20 years to, to decide that, but uh, the, the, the idea of, of one day maybe telling a, a tale of, about these people would, would be, uh, uh, a dream, and uh, but it, yeah, it took a little while. I mean, this is a, a film in part about destiny, about fate, and you know, not to get too highfalutin, but it, you, it seems like you found the right filmmaker. You found the right match in Robert Eggers. If you guys have seen, obviously, The Witch, The Lighthouse, uh, a very particular, specific visionary of a, a young filmmaker. Um, Talk to me about like the early days of this collaboration. As I understand it, you were meeting about a different project, and somehow this came up or an idea of something like this came up yeah it felt like the the norns had uh, decided that this was our fate uh so about, about 10 years ago lars knutsen uh who is a danish born u.s based uh producer um who ultimately produced this movie with us um lars and i teamed up with the the goal and, and uh, of the the intention was to uh uh, to make a big epic Viking story, but that something that was rooted in the old Icelandic sagas, the old uh, Edda poetry, and something that would um, try to capture the essence of those, the authenticity and the because um, I, I, I had really I'd never seen that on screen before, um, and something that took the um, uh, the, the spiritual elements, the supernatural elements seriously, and and really went into that world um so that was our goal and uh but it took so for four or five years we were um trying to figure out if we should base the story on uh, center it around one of the sagas or if it should be a combination of the sagas or if it should be there are also some crazy historical figures during the viking age that could be potentially also a great starting point so we were basically just um trying to figure out again a starting point of uh, something to what would be the genesis of this and then um i met out with rob uh, unrelated to that five years ago and um it turned out uh that he had just returned from iceland he was not interested in vikings he thought it was like a macho bullshit culture and it was like 
the kind of the cliches and the, um, he was not into it. But then he went to Iceland. He kind of fell in love with the, 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 um, the people, the country, the culture, and got really interested in, in, in Norse mythology. Um, so, so I basically met with him at the perfect time where he was fired up about that. And I told him um, that I had this desire of, of one day making a Viking movie. He got fired up and we ended up spending that meeting not talking about the project we were supposed to talk about, but instead Vikings for two hours. And coincidentally, Lars Knudsen had, this was just as, I believe The Witch was still playing in theaters. It was around that time. Um, I had seen The Witch and I thought it was incredible. And, and um, it was very obvious that Rob um, is all about authenticity and his attention to detail is extraordinary. And it really did feel like I was transported back in time watching that movie. And again, th th those were all components that, we, that were essential for, for our movie. Um, so I, um, again, Lars Knudsen had produced The Witch. So leaving that meeting, I called Lars immediately and I said, I just sat down with Rob. He's incredible and he's a Viking fan now. He wasn't, but he is now. <laughs> and I think we should ask him if he wants to do this uh, and, and team up on this. And that's how, that was kind of the genesis of what ultimately became The Northman. It's a, it's a gorgeous film to watch. It also looks like a miserable film to make. Um, <laughs> Like, it, it, it's palpable on screen. You, you did not, I, don't, I wonder if there are days when you're like, maybe I should have done like the, you know, the, uh, the James Cameron thing and just shot this in a void in Australia. <laughs> yeah, because Rob had done two films, The Witch and The Lighthouse, two very small, low budget art house films. The Lighthouse is two, two dudes in a lighthouse. It's, there are no big set pieces. <laughs> Um, so you can, I wouldn't say that it, those shoots were easy, but to shoot it on film, scenes with just one long camera move um, is doable. Um, no one had told Rob how to shoot an action film. No one told him that you probably need more setups and more coverage and to do a big set piece like the raid of the Slav village as a wonder is crazy. Um, but again, no, no one told Rob. <laughs> so, so he was like, well, we're going to shoot it on with Jaron Blaschka, his amazing cinematographer. Um, and they were like, well, we're going to do it the way we work. We, it's on film, and it's one long shot, and we just kind of plan it accordingly. And um, everyone was terrified, but also quite exhilarated, because, it, again, it's a way of working that is incredibly unique. Um, and again, especially when it comes to um, a, a big action movie. Um, so it, it was not easy, but also we knew that it wouldn't be easy. Right. So we um, started prep on those big set pieces several months before the shoot, um, working with the stunt team and also with Jaron in his camera department because so much of it is about the relationship between the actors and the camera, because we're all, we're running, but the camera operator is also running. So it's about finding that rhythm so we, so, so we can have um, the right fluidity to those shots. Um, and again, Rob being all about authenticity, it's, um, he, he chose amazing locations, but they're remote and it's, we're in the elements and we're out there and, and it, 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 it is a blessing and a curse because it's, it's exhausting and tough, and um, but it's also incredibly immersive because um, when you shoot those sequences, the fact um, it is hard to do it all the, whole, all the way through, but it's also quite nice to not have to stop and go because uh, you once you're in it and you, you, the adrenaline is, is pumping, you don't, it's not like, oh, do this and then go get a cu cappuccino and then come back into the rest. Like you're actually going through the whole thing um, and you're in an environment that is, 360, 100% real. Like those sets were built on some of them a year before we started shooting the film with Neil Price, who's an amazing uh, Viking scholar, historian, and a team of four or five other world-class Viking experts that worked with Rob on making sure that the longhouse was built exactly the way a longhouse would have been built, with the right type of wood, and that the longship would have the right type of nails. Like everything was legit. Um, which made my job 
I wouldn't say easy, but definitely easier than it could have been. Because again, like you, you're, when you're in those clothes, you know that everything is um, authentic. Um, and you walk around the set and everything is and feels real. When everybody's at the top of their game, they're all putting so much heart and soul and blood and tears into every facet from the clothing to the set design to the shots. If you don't want to let down that six minute one or no, and also yeah. credit to, to focus and Regency for trusting Rob, um, for investing this much money and on, and, and on, um, a project like this, um, and a, a, an art house filmmaker who's made two low budget movies and also allowing him to shoot it the way he wanted with the team he wanted. He had the same costume designer, set, set designer um, that he uh, has, has collaborated with for years. And that is incredibly rare. They often go, oh, you've done a couple of cool indie films. Come do th this movie for us, but we gotta, we'll give you the team we'll around you. We'll give you the you. team. Yeah. You're going to shoot it on a sound stage and we tell you how to do it kind of. Um, but um, I th that was really exciting for me. Uh, and it, it, again, it is quite rare. Are you considering a side hustle of like a diet book or exercise guide to the <laughs> to the Amleth body for 2022? Oh God, no! <laughs> I'm so I'm so done with that. <laughs> I mean, look, you're obviously always in in shape, but this guy I just we all just saw on screen is like a monster of a dude. Um, <laughs> and I know you transformed for Tarzan in a different way. Um, that took a lot, but this. I mean, what were you trying to get across the physicality? What was important to you to, to give off for Amleth? Psychologically, this was easier than Tarzan because on Tarzan, I had to be uh, very lean. So Magnus Ligbeck, the a, a friend of mine who, who I, yeah, one Magnus fan. <laughs> well, the Magnus heads are out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Magnus fan club of one is here. Um, Magnus. Yeah. <laughs> Mag oh, two. Magnus is fantastic. And uh, we worked together on Tarzan. And on that one, well, first of all, we'd never worked together before. So that was also, um, uh, we'd been friends for years, but we'd never worked together. So Magnus didn't know how my body would respond to specific diets or spe specific type of training and all that. And um, Tarzan had to be kind of lean. So it was nine months of... Uh, no alcohol, I do like my beer, and I wasn't allowed any. And no bread, no pasta, no fast carbs, no sugar. I, couldn't even, I wasn't even allowed a glass of orange juice in the morning. So um, that, that was a much stricter diet when it came on the Northman. First of all, we had that almost nine, 10 months together on Tarzan, so we could kind of hit the ground running when we started prep on the Northman because we, Magnus, we knew each other very well. Magnus knew how my body would respond to specific types of training and diet. And also the goal was, um, the character's name is Bjornulfur, he's a bear wolf, so it was quite easy. It was just like, all right, just try to look a bit more like a bear. And <laughs> um, so it was more about just getting a bit bigger and, 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 and uh, getting a physique that was um, not as lean as my, my natural physique and putting on weight. So. Um, he treated me to some uh, uh, beers and pasta and bread, and, uh, and so that, that was a lifesaver. Um, the cast in this film is remarkable. I'm uh, such a fan of so many of these great actors from Annual Taylor Joy. Ethan Hawke sets the table with Willem Dafoe in the beginning, with the young performer as well. Um, Nicole Kidman, I mean, it sounds insane to say, but like you shouldn't be surprised by a Nicole Kidman performance at this point. But she's amazing in this. I mean, newsflash. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you've obviously worked with her she's before. Got a bright future editor. She's doing all right. Yeah. She's doing okay. <laughs> I spot talent, yeah. Alex. I think I know Just something. Just you wait, guys. <laughs> Remember where you heard it first. She's gonna hit her stride. <laughs> yeah. But you worked with her on Big Little Lies. Was she your idea? I take it, or I think we all agree. As soon as the so Nicole and I, um, uh, Big Little Lies was. Uh, an extraordinary experience um, and oh thank you thank you um, but to share that with um, uh, with Nicole was uh, a very bonding experience because again it, it demanded so much um, so much trust in order to go into that darkness on um, mentally and physically uh, so we're really kind of needed to 
to be there together uh, and to trust each other in order to kind of commit to it the way we had to. Um, so th that connection was incredibly strong and one of the high greatest connections I've ever felt on a, on a set. Um, so when, when the first, very early on, even before the first draft, when we started talking about Creed and Gudrun, I, I think we all agreed that, that Nicole would be the dream uh, queen. Um, so in, in after Big Little Lies, Nicole and I had said, let's find something. Let's do something fun together. Let's That's do pretty a much what we said. <laughs> That's kind of what we said. Let's do something again, but maybe next time not as dark and twisted as this. Oh, you, uh, you fucked that one up, Alex. Yeah, so then two years later, I called us. I said, Nicole, I found something. Um, you're now my mother, and you try to kiss me. And <laughs> so it's... Um, Please, I never knew I needed to hear Nicole Kim and scream, kill him, uh, like yeah. I did in this film. It's chilling, and I just want to hear it on a loop the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was extraordinary. And it was... Uh, that scene in which she uh, tries to kiss me was actually our, our first scene together. And, and Nicole joined the shoot like halfway through production. Uh, she was busy on another project and we were shooting all the big like set pieces that she's not in. Um, and then she joined us and we had that scene coming up. And uh, it was just after two months of as much as I love crawling around in the mud and fighting, but to be reunited with Nicole on a scene that is so beautifully written and in so many like twists and turns in that scene was uh, definitely the highlight of the entire shoot. It was incredible. And because we know each other so well and we have established that trust, it, was, it also meant that we could just show up to set and again day one for 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 us together and just jump in and and uh and 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 go for it it's a remarkable scene from both of you um another remarkable scene i alluded to earlier this is definitely far and away the best naked volcano fight i've ever seen in a film <laughs> top 10 at least right top five <laughs> yeah be kind to yourself um i i watched an interview with, with robert eggers your director the other day um CG genitals in that fight? Correct me if I'm wrong. Or we're Ken dolls. We got nothing. <laughs> it's it's kind of creepy. <laughs> I haven't I'm analyzed. The like, <laughs> there's nothing. <laughs> yeah. Is it as fun to shoot as it looks uh, in the film? I mean, where in the shoot did you shoot that? Is that like circled on the calendar? Like it's this is going to be a day or a week? A week. And it was on... Um, of course, as they always do when they plan stuff, they put that at the very end just before Christmas. Because like, oh, the guys are going to be naked and, and wet because I was covered in blood and sweat. So we're going to hose them down. And it was literally like snowing two of those five days and night shoots. So it was, um, uh, and obviously not done in a nice warm studio. It was in a quarry outdoors. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, it was uh, definitely quite immersive. And uh, and also, the, it's probably the toughest sequence to shoot because unlike uh, the other big set pieces are uh, technically quite difficult, but psychologically easy, or not easy, but at least like, again, in the raid, Amleth is Beowulf and he's in a berserker state of mind. So it's just like <clears throat> that kind of thing. This was tricky because it was technically uh, quite difficult, and again, as a wonder, um, but it's, it also had to be the emotional climax of the movie. So it wasn't just like, all right, I'm just uh, like a berserker state of mind and going for it. It, 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 it. You had to kind of find, find that in the midst of the chaos of all that. All right, you ready to go deep? We're going deep now. We're going back. We're going back, Alex. You ready? All right. Here we go. So first of all, we, we've chatted a bunch over the years. I went back into the archives and I looked at some of our conversations. And I noticed something. I don't know if you guys noticed, Alexander Skarsgård is very tall, like he's super tall. I want to show you a couple photos. Let's look at, look, look at this first photo, please. Look how tall he is. Okay. I don't know if you can tell. Oh, God. 
Look at that douchebag. <laughs> Wait, which one are you talking about? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, so the posture. Let's go to the next photo. This is at Sundance. I was talking to you. Jesus Christ. So do you not know what to do with your body? Like, do you not know how to sit? My God, I'm, I'm way too relaxed. <laughs> You live it professional, dude. Well, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. I'm saying that. Okay. But you're doing great tonight. Look at him. We can take it off. We don't need to stare at it. I'm going to sit up. Man. <laughs> God. Is that I, a... It's okay. This is an intervention on how to sit. That's basically yeah. what this is about. There we go. There we go. So the true Scars Guardians, I don't know. What, what are your fans called? Are they, do they have a name? Do they have a moniker? The Alexander Skarsgård heads? Okay. You mean my mom? Yeah. Your, <laughs> your mom. Yeah. They know it goes all the way back to, and I believe it's your screen debut in a little movie called Zoolander. Okay. I can't think of a better movie to like make your mark in than Zoolander. Will you indulge me? Can we look at a clip from Zoolander and tell me what you were thinking? <laughs> Please, okay. yeah. All right, let's Love take a you. look at a portion, not the, not the sad part, the happy uh, part. I can't stand Hansel. I know, right? Riding in on that scooter like he's so cool. And the way Hansel combs his hair. Or like, doesn't. It's like, excuse me, but have you ever heard of styling gel? <laughs> I'm sure Hansel's heard of styling gel. He's a male model. Well, Earth to Brent, I was making a joke. Oh, uh, Earth to Mikis, duh. Okay, I knew that. Earth to Brint. I'm not so sure you did, because you were all, well, I'm sure he's heard of styling gel. Like you didn't know it was a joke. <laughs> I knew it was a joke, Mikus. I just didn't get it right away. Earth to Brint. Would you guys stop it already? Did you ever think that maybe there's more to life than being really, really, really ridiculously good looking? <laughs> I mean, maybe we should be doing something more meaningful with our lives. Like helping people. Uh, Derek, what people? I don't know. People who need help. Models help people. They make them feel good about themselves. They also show them how to dress cool and wear their hair in interesting ways? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess so. You know what could really help you sort through these important issues? What? Orange mocha frappuccino! <laughs> I don't know if you guys have seen Zoolander, but it doesn't end well for... No, it does not. ...for Mikus. No. Um, I don't know how often you've seen Zoolander. I've seen, I watch Zoolander like every other year because it's a classic. Um, when you were watching yourself in that, like what, what memories I hadn't come... seen that in probably 15 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so what comes rushing back? What do you, I mean, what an opportunity. I mean, obviously Ben Stiller was a known quantity. You must have known you were in something pretty cool. I was... Um... It was all very surreal because I was an uh, an actor, basically. <laughs> well, I, I just started out in Sweden, but I was in LA visiting my dad, who was working on a movie, and um, didn't have representation out there. Again, I just started. I was doing a play in Stockholm, and my dad's manager at a dinner one night at the house was just like, "Hey, oh, you're acting in Sweden. Let let me see you to an audition. W would you like that?" And I thought it'd be a funny story for my friends back home, like, ooh, I'm in Hollywood, I'm going to an audition. Um, and I'd know I, I didn't know what project it was, or it, I, knew, I knew nothing, I was just like, this is a funny story. And got there, got the sides, read it, and they called, I, I didn't know what a callback was, so I was like, they called me the next day, it's like, can you come back and do it again? I was like, why? I just, all right, well, all right. <laughs> um, and walked back into the room, and then Ben Stiller was there, and I, Recognized him, I was like, all right, cool. And did it again. And then two days later, they call, like, all right, we're gonna fly you. Uh, I'd never flown business class. So we're like, we're gonna fly you business class to New York. We're gonna pick you up in a town car, take you to a nice hotel, and you're gonna like be in this movie. And it was absolutely insane. Two days later, we were shooting this, and we were shooting the scene, uh, the following scene, in which we're driving down Broadway in a Jeep, and then we have this gasoline fight. Um, and it was, it was incredibly fun. 
we had a blast, a really great group of people. Um, but it also kind of distorted my view of, or uh, my idea of what it was like to be an actor in Hollywood because um, it just was, it was just too easy. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but after that, you must have been very excited. Okay, this is awesome. And then years of unemployment, essentially, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I went because I was I was still at a theater in Stockholm. So I did that again. It was not even two weeks of work, but it's so much fun. And then I went back, and then <clears throat> my dad's manager said, "Well, if you want, we can represent you because um, you're one for one. That's pretty good. And <laughs> but you got to come out here. Like when when you're on, on stage in Stockholm, we can't really do much for you. But when you're done with that play, you should come out and we'll we'll send you out for more auditions. And I, a year later, when I was done on at the theater, I thought, well, all right, let's go out there and make it two for two. <laughs> and uh, went out to LA and again, with the notion of like, you get a phone call, you walk in and a movie star is sitting there and then you read a couple of lines and then you, you fly business class somewhere. <laughs> um, I got this, yeah. But then reality was quite different because when I got back, um, uh, and it, playing Migas for five minutes in Zooland didn't really like create any waves in Hollywood. Um, like, were you, are you good at auditioning? Is that, I mean, some no, actors I'm love quite, it, some no, actors I'm, hate. I wasn't very good at it. And I also like, it also made me realize that project like Zoolander are far and few between out there. Um, uh, when you come out as a young actor uh, with no, uh, nothing to, sh like, I didn't have any cool projects. It, was like, it wasn't like, oh, I was in this Oscar-nominated Swedish movie. I had nothing. Like, my shoulder was very short. It was basically that scene. Um, so it, it means that you're, um, you get in on these, called in for these cattle calls, basically, for a jock in a, in a pilot for a sitcom or a, or, or a, um, a, uh, a movie or, you know, boyfriend number four in a horror movie uh, uh, that you don't really like. It's not a fun character. It's not a good project, but you're like, oh, and now I'm auditioning for something that I don't really want. And what happens to all the Zoolanders out there? Like, well, wh where are those projects? Um, so for several years, whenever something with potential came up or something that I was thought had some potential, something that was exciting, a character or a project that was had some um, yeah, a little bit of potential. I um, w didn't have a shot. Like if, even if I was lucky enough to get a couple of callbacks, they would always there would always be an established actor who'd be like, oh, "That's great, I'll take that, thank you," <laughs> and because uh, that ha that's how it works out there. Um, so it, it wasn't until. Um, uh, four four years after so moving out to LA, um, uh, David Simon and Ed Burns did uh, who did The Wire. They were going to do this limited series called Generation Kill um, about the the invasion in, uh, in, of Iraq, and they their style is very documentarian, and they intentionally went after unknown. So they, they, like, it was basically stated, like, we want, some people had done a bunch of things, but they didn't want big names, at least. Um, and then I went, like, ooh, this might be my shot. <laughs> it's funny, like, we need those projects every uh, once in a while. I, I can't tell you, like, how many interviews I've done with actors, successful actors, that were, like, in Band of Brothers, for instance, in, like, two scenes. Yeah. Right? Those, those like, ensembles that yeah. were all unknowns. Yeah. And then 15 years later, like, that's all they needed. They needed just some some shot yeah and and that was that was the one that was the, the yeah. well pretty much the first um uh project i i uh, uh got even close to getting uh, uh and it happened to be something that i was incredibly excited about i'm always fascinated by the i mean like look you ended up with the clearly the viking the norseman that you were meant to be but is there in the marvel vaults an audition tape of you dressed as thor you were up for that. Did, how, how I auditioned for it with every other dude in Hollywood, pretty much. Uh, um, I don't think I, I don't, again, I probably wasn't very good. Really? I don't think so. I don't think so. I remember I'm, I met Kenneth Branagh. He was lovely. Um, 
but it was, I think it was like when I was one year into True Blood, it was very early. It was like, so I did Generation Kill and went f in, in Africa for seven months, 07, and then we started True Blood 08. And I think this was like 09 maybe or something, the, the, the auditions for Thor. Uh, so I was still very green and um, I, yeah, I don't think I was very good. I wasn't ready for that. Well, again, the, the, right, the right role at the right time came. Yeah. Um, one of those right roles, and you just alluded to it, was True Blood. True Blood really. Thank you. True Blood clearly changed things a lot of, for many actors in that cast. Uh, I have one more clip to show you tonight, and it's a, a clip between you and Anna Paquin. Oh. Let's take a look. It's from season four, I believe. I remember everything. Us. Nothing's changed. Except you. I haven't changed. I'm just more. The other Eric is still here. Mm-hmm. So he... Look at me. Can't you see him in my eyes? What's the problem? Bill. When you were about to kill him, I just couldn't bear the thought of a world without him in it. I think it was how I was able to stop you. I love you. I don't want to lie to you. But I can't help it. I love him, too. How is that possible? Sometimes I think it's because you've both given me your blood. Maybe it's just chemical. You gave yourself to me completely. You are mine. I never promised that. And you gave yourself to me. Completely. Yes, I did. I love you. Damn, Bill. <laughs> Always getting in the way. Oh, Bill. <laughs> So talk to me a little bit about just obviously, again, a very pivotal point in, in your career and that relationship in particular, those two characters is very integral to the series and, and probably I would think a, a soft spot in your heart working with Anna for all those years. Um, th what does that take you back to, to think of that, that relationship and that, uh, that character, Eric? Well, it's the, by far the longest professional relationship I've ever had. <laughs> it's seven years. Yeah. Um, as, a, as an actor, when you freelance, it's a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and then you have this hopefully intense connection, and then you move on, and you might stay friends, but you're, you know, your career will take you in different directions. Um, so to have um, this every year for seven years, we did about seven months and then five months off, um, was such a, such a treat. Um, because it was uh, an, an extraordinary group of people, not only in front of camera, but also behind. We had the same, pretty much the whole, the same crew every year. And that's also something um, that I really treasured, the fact that Larry was our boom operator for seven years. And again, like you make these connections and then it's, um, you move on, but to have that for so many years was really special. And, um, and, all, and when we started the show, it sounded so preposterous and crazy. I gotta remember, this was before um, Twilight or Vampire Diaries. It was like 2008 was the first season. It was very early, so uh, vampire, Viking, and fairies, and everyone was just, this is crazy. So no one knew whether it was gonna work or not. So the, to, to kind of experience that, um, shooting the first season, having a blast, but also thinking like, Alan Ball is super talented, but 
there's no way this is going to work. Like, is this, are people actually going to watch this? And then the, how it kind of hit the zeitgeist in a, in a, in a way uh, to kind of grow together, all of us, actors and crew, was, was really special. Um, I'm sure you guys obviously are aware of the extraordinary talent in Alexander's family, um, number of actors, uh, very successful actors. I'm curious, like, do you guys, like, are you aware of, like, what you guys are working on? Like, does does your dad still say, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be Baron Harkonnen in Dune? Does Bill say, what do you think of Pennywise? Like, do you, like, talk work with each other? Or is it kind of, like, do you read the trades or get a see a thing on Twitter and get surprised like everybody Some, else? It's a little bit of both. Um, we're... Yeah, we're incredibly <laughs> uh, tight, but also terrible at like communicating. So like, I will call Bill and I when I'm in Stockholm and I'll be like, "Hey, you want to go for a beer?" And he's like, "Oh no, I'm in South Africa shooting this thing. Look, here's the picture." I was like, "Oh, that looks crazy." Um, oh, I've been here for three months. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, so it's um, and it's it, like South Stockholm has always been our base, our hub, and. I'm the only one living here. Everyone else is is within like two blocks of where we grew up. Um, Sam and Gus, my two brothers, actually live in the apartment we've lived in since 1980. Like it was uh, an apartment in, in in South Stockholm that day when mom and dad moved out. They divided into two apartments. So Gus and his family live in one part, and Sam and his in in, in the other. Um, and everyone else is like again within a few blocks. So. It's kind of our, that's the epicenter of our universe. And then we're all traveling around doing crazy stuff. And then we come, always come back to that point. I, I don't know how much of your like taste in film going back was informed by your family, but the last couple of years on the podcast, I've been asking folks for their comfort movies. Like, and often it's something from their childhood or, or something that could be in recent years that you keep coming back to. I'm curious, does like one come, jump out to you? Is there a movie that you come back to if you need a pick me up or if you need some comfort in your life for whatever reason yeah one that stands so dad had a pretty extensive collection of dvd uh, no god vhs um cassettes growing up kinescopes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah uh and uh, it was mostly black and white movies, a lot of Marx Brothers and um, uh, the old, like, Errol Flynn movies. Um, and then I got to see Star Wars, which blew me away. Um, and then, so I was, like, watching, and dad and, they, dad and mom and my uncle, who lived upstairs with his wife, they would have these, like, Woody Allen nights, watch, like, old Woody Allen, like, the early Woody Allen movies, the, the bananas and... Um, Take the money and run like those those more like little super comedy stuff. Oh, Love and Death was one of my all time favorites. Love and Death, yeah. And I was kind of too young to understand it, but I I, I was like, oh, this is funny um, because they're laughing. Um, but 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 then I saw, and I was a massive fan of Star Wars. Um, but speaking of comfort movies, I remember when I saw Romancing the Stone, uh, <laughs> Robert Zemeckis, um, and. It blew my, and again, caveat here, I haven't seen it in probably 20 years, so it's not, I, I don't know if it holds up, but I remember watching it, and it blew my mind because I was familiar with the concept of comedies from like the old Woody Allen movies and, and, and the Marx Brothers and Laurel and Hardy, um, and the concept of like action movies, or like adventure films, sci-fi, like through the Star Wars movies, but this was a movie that had action elements and f it was funny. And that blew me. I was like, what? You can do both in the same movie? That's crazy. <laughs> uh, so it was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And I would watch it pretty much every weekend. Um, but again, I, I haven't seen it in many years. But. I haven't either. But a Zemeckis pick is always a good pick. And I, I'll recommend, if you haven't in a while, Jewel of the Nile is not a great film. It's the sequel. But it did give us one of the great music videos of all time, When the Going Gets Tough which features the entire cast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good one. That's a Go good, back on good YouTube song. and yeah, check yeah, it yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, let's end with a few questions from the audience. There are a lot of questions about this film and you, so we'll run through a couple, and then we'll, uh, we'll all just contemplate what we watched here tonight for the rest of our lives. <laughs> good, luck, good luck sleeping tonight. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> you owe them all a lot of therapy, <laughs> yeah. Bills. Um, 
since this was a passion project, what things did you personally feel needed to be in the film, if anything? You alluded to this a bit, but what, yeah, at its core, what was like? Well, it was the, the essence of the old Icelandic sagas. It was important to capture the, the laconic tone of it, the, the harshness of the landscape and the characters. Um, I felt that a lot of, uh, not a lot, but the few, I didn't want the language to be flowery. I didn't want it to be, um, uh, I, again, I wanted it to be very precise because uh, that's the end of poetry. It's, it's all about that kind of, it's very concise. Um, uh, so not too verbose. And, and a, an important element was to kind of go, go beyond the, the stereotypes of Vikings and the cliches and, and take the, the supernatural element seriously. This is an interesting one because, uh, yeah, it, it ran through my brain too. The question is, would you consider Nicole's character the villain? Like, who is the villain in this story? It's kind of an interesting question. It's an interesting question, and I think it should be left a question and not an answer because I think it's for, it makes for a more interesting conversation. Uh, so we had the first premiere in Stockholm two weeks ago, um, and that was the first time I'd, I saw the movie with an audience. And not only any audience, but like an audience of my my mom and dad, my, my siblings, and my childhood friends. So it was a very emotional evening. Um, but getting the reactions afterwards uh, was really fascinating because some people, how they interpreted the, the ending, for example, like some people uh, saw it very positive and as a happy thing, and some people were miserable. <laughs> and some people, and, and again, same thing with heroes versus villains. and and. and and I was really intrigued by that, and 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 I feel uh, I've really again this is we're coming to the end of three weeks of press now, um, but I've consciously avoided talking about my interpretation of again the ending. Is he happy? Has he landed? Is he where he wants to be? Is he doing the right thing? Who's a hero? Who's a villain? I think it makes for a. Um, hopefully a more immersive experience when you watch a movie, at least I feel that way, the less I know about um, the characters or where the filmmaker or producer or actor wants me, what, like, what do you want to take, what, like, what do you want the audience to take away from this? I never like answering that because it's like, it's up to you. Like, I, it's out there now. So I, I want to leave that open to your imagination in a way. Uh, this is from... Camille and Alex, well done tag teaming on a question, and they have a smiley face on the card, so bonus points for that. Uh, so much of the soundscape in the film was built with beating drums and pounding percussion. Was this recreated on set when filming, and did it affect your performance? Um, a little bit was on set. Um, the, 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 um, the transformation um, uh, in the beginning of the movie, the, uh, the ritual, that was all done with drummers on set behind camera to give us the right beats for that kind of. Um, from Sydney, how did you maintain both the physical and emotional stamina during those long takes? Uh, I think it's just adrenaline. You just keep going and going and going and then you look at it and see what's not working and then you just go straight back into it. and. Um, Again, because we kept going, in, in a way it was less exhausting right. than if you go like full throttle and then you, you sit in your trailer up, for an hour go and down, then go out. Yeah, yeah. This was just like chaos till we finally got it. Right. And then you can sleep for a night. Right. Is there a scene when you watch back the film that you take kind of the most pride in or just you can't um, like believe how it was done and how it was executed and just that you got it to the finish line? Um. Well, the, the raid was tricky because there's so many components to it. And the raid is, it, it looks like it's a one, but I think it's two different shots. It's, it's stitched together. Is that, is that right? Two shots, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's easy, basically. Yeah, walk it's, in the park. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, there were so many components to that. Yeah. That was, that was tricky, uh, technically. But again, like I, we talked about earlier, the, um, the, the fight at the end, the end fight was... Um, more exhausted. I was more exhausted after that week right. because, well, first of all, it was, a, yeah, towards the end of the shoot, it was at night, it was cold, and 
not only technically difficult, but emotionally it was, it was uh, very draining. Coming off of a project like this, do you take away like that you can enjoy all manners of, of, of filming? Because it strikes me, you know, we talked about like Edgar's technique, these long takes, these very intense kind of immersive environments. Um, and then like on the flip side of a different kind of immersion, it was something with the sadly the late great Jean-Marc Vallée sounded like on Big Little Lies, a very kind of um, actor friendly, loose environment on set, seemingly giving you the space to kind of move where you wanted to move. Yeah. Do you find both rewarding in their own way? Do you, in the future, do you think you'll gravitate towards one over the other? This, uh, this, I've never worked like this before, so I'm way more used to um, uh, the kind of more slightly, uh, Big Little Lives was very, uh, we barely blocked the scenes. Right. It was, you show up and you play around with it and it's all handheld and um, kind of like Lars von Trier works as well. It's like he never blocks a scene. It's just like, try it, we'll see what happens. Um, but I've never done a project that was this meticulously planned. And so, again, with just one shot, that was, um, it could easily, f I think at the beginning, it's a moment where you have to decide if you're gonna resist it and and be like, no, I'm an actor, I need to explore the space, I need to find it. That would have been a disaster because Rob does not work that way. So it's either that or embrace it and see this as a challenge and try to, all right, well, these are the parameters. This is how Rob and Jaron wants to shoot the scene. My job is to try to instill life into this and not make it look robotic. Uh, well, I think it's telling, because like, I heard Willem Dafoe do a lot of interviews around the White House, and he talked about how at first he was like very resistant to it. Yeah. And now, lo and behold, he's obviously an Eggers fan. He's back and, and enjoys it. Yeah, because I really, I, 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 and I agree with Willem there. I really decided, I was just like, I don't know, I'm going to embrace this. This is, Let's see if we can do this. And then when it, it is tough, it's challenging, but when it works, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And, and uh, Rob is so wonderful to collaborate with. Um, it's not didactic. It's, he has a very clear idea and very clear image of how he wants it to, to play out, but um, uh, he, he's definitely open to, to ideas. Um, uh, when it comes to... The, I mean, you can't completely change the shot because again, they planned it six months in advance. So then that would take another six months to do that. So, but but it I uh, no I, I I love the fact that I got to go between uh, first Big Little Lies and then this and then right after this was Succession, which was also very like handheld like that kind of, which was su super fun. And after seven months of this, it was great to go and do something where like oh just play around, see you know. I'm going to end with the most important question of the night. Um, who is Rex Danger? And is Rex Danger you on Instagram, Alexander Skarsgård? I'm, I'm not on social media. Yeah. No! <laughs> no! <laughs> and this is when the audience revolts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start throwing stuff. <laughs> Are you telling me a fib? Are you lying? No. Who do you know? You've, you've heard that at, that must have been asked of you in the past. Then who's controlling Rex Danger? It's not somebody in the Skarsgård universe? Josh, who's controlling anything? Wow. <laughs> Going deep. <laughs> um, I'll let you evade that one. Uh, and I want to congratulate you again. Guys, spread the good word on this film because. No. Thank you for coming out tonight, guys. Well, I, I, I mean, I do want to say it's a special piece of work, man. And, and you, you know, he talked about it earlier. These are the kind of movies, these big swings. This is, this is a, a bold kind of vision. And, um, you know, spread the good word because we want more of this uh, on the big screen. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for coming out tonight. Give it up for Alexander Skarsgård. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for coming out.